Uh, my name is Troy Reeves. I head the UW-Madison Oral History Program. I'm teaching a History 201 class this semester. It's about food, uh, labor, social justice, so I always have what I call a setting the table section. So we're going to set the table here first before we introduce Paul. Uh, so thanks to the Haven Center for uh, having us all here today. Uh, also, Sound Studies at UW, uh, and just for boilerplate and the fact that they give us money. Uh, Sound Studies at UW is a Borghese Mellon workshop and is meant to help build infrastructure at UW-Madison for connecting researchers, teachers, archivists, and other community members interested in the study of sound. And so there's a couple different handouts going. One of those is from the Sound Studies at UW folks. If you're interested in learning more, sign up and give us your email. We'll put you on our list, sir. We do not sell your information. I don't think we sell your information. Uh, a couple of things the Haven Center folks wanted me to say. There are two more Paul Ortiz events, those of you who can't see all the way up here. Uh, tomorrow, 4 o'clock, so same time, same station, Paul will be right here in 3401 Sterling Hall uh, with Killed Helping Workers to Organize African American and Latina Latino Narratives in the Century of Jim and Juan Crow. And then tomorrow at 2.20, open seminar for students, faculty, and the public in 8100 Social Science. If you want to go to that one and you've never been to social science before, give yourself some time getting through that building. It's, uh, it can be a challenge sometimes to find the room you're looking for. It's 8108, and it's Thursday. Thursday, yes, yeah. Thursday at 220. Thank you, Patrick. All right, so um, let's get started. I state this as sincerely as possible. It is a pleasure to introduce Paul Ortiz. Uh, Paul and I had known of each other, each other's work for at least a decade when he called me in early 2013. Uh, the context behind that call, after years of, I'll just say it, whining, uh, I had convinced the leadership of the Oral History Association to hold their 2014 annual meeting in Madison. As incoming 2014 OHA president, Paul was in charge of that meeting. Uh, the OHA structure allows for the incoming president to ask one or two people to head the program and local arrangements committees. So when Paul called, it was not unexpected that he asked me to head the local arrangements committee. I mean, I expected some consequence to my incessant whining. I started working with Paul and found out two important things. First, we both grew up out west. Second, we both love NBA basketball. So we bonded over the 1979 NBA champion Seattle Supersonics and bemoaned how the NBA helped hasten their demise. Now, while some will say the Sonics didn't die, they just thundered their way to Oklahoma City, Paul and I will attest that that's just a lie. More importantly, I found out that he loved the OHA as much as I did. Uh, we, along with many, many others, presented attendees in October, 14th, October 2014 with, and yes, I'm biased, the best damn Oral History Association meeting ever. Of course, it didn't hurt that Mother, Mother Nature gave us five days of beautiful weather, like today, except more sunny and warmer. Most importantly, Paul's work in oral history, both published and pedagogical, as I said when I introduced him last month at the 50th Annual o Oral History Association Conference, speaks truth to power. And even though today's topic, unless Paul's mastered the art of time travel, doesn't touch on his oral history bona fides, it will, I'm sure, illuminate you all to what I already know. Paul Ortiz rocks. <laughs> Paul Ortiz is an associate professor and the director of the award-winning Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Today's talk is entitled The Mexican War of Independence in U.S. History, Tearing Down American Exceptionalism and Moving Forward in the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Paul Ortiz. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here, to spend time with uh, colleagues and community. Uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, Haven Center, um, the, the founder of the Haven Center actually was a person who worked very closely with scholars that I looked up to when I was a junior faculty member at UC Santa Cruz, uh, people like Jim O'Connor, uh, people like Bill Friedland, who was the founder of the Department of Community Studies at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so it's just a great honor. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, I really don't feel I'm, I'm very uh, deserving of this honor, but I'll try to make the next three days um, interesting. We're really going to go on a historical journey, uh, an odyssey, if you will. And there is going to be an element of time travel, uh, to borrow from Troy's kind introduction. Uh, next month, I'm giving a talk on Kurt Vonnegut, uh, titled Kurt Vonnegut's War, uh, the Humanities of Combat. And those of you familiar with Slaughterhouse-Five will know that Kurt Vonnegut was a combat veteran in World War II. Uh, he was a, an American POW, 
he survived the Dresden firebombing, and then he wrote a tremendous novel in which he talked about the firebombing and he talked about time travel. Uh, and I grew up in a military background, and that's why I talk a lot about imperialism and anti-imperialism. Because long before I was a professor, in an earlier version of life, uh, I was a soldier. Um, I served with the 82nd Airborne Division and 7th Special Forces. I fought in Central America. And so I was a, kind of a soldier of empire in those days, in, in my earlier life, if you will. Growing up, um, that's all we really had. I'm from a third generation of military veterans. My grandfather actually fought in the Mexican Revolution. Uh, I had uncles, great uncles, who fought in the Pacific during World War II. So growing up, war was all we knew. But when I came back to the U.S. in 86, and I listened to the song, Buffalo Soldiers, by Bob Marley, and then a lot of things begin to crystallize. Why is it that black and brown people are often sent out to the frontiers both in terms of Native American history in the early 19th century, the Buffalo Soldiers, Bob Marley is, is, is referencing them. Uh, why do we end up going to places like Honduras or Colombia or El Salvador? And I began thinking about this because the people that I was supposed to be confronting and fighting were people that shared my same surname. Some of them looked like me. Um, and so the question of imperialism, just by way of introduction, for me is not simply kind of an intellectual abstraction. It's not simply a political term, it's very personal and it's part of my family history and how we ended up in the United States. Um, but what I'd like to do really over the next few days is to talk about, and by the way, I've subtitled, you know, as a historian, you're always trying to stay timely. And so I did change, I added something to my subtitle, you see, from John Quincy Adams to Donald Trump. And I will try to explain that as we as we kind of move forward. But just by way of, of getting started, does anyone know who these two individuals are on this front slide? Faculty are excluded for now. <laughs> this this would be an extra credit question. Does anyone know who these two individuals are? We'll try the students first. Yes. James Madison. That's right, James Madison on the right. And it's great. Excellent. The individual on the left? Donald Trump. <laughs> no, but that, but you get extra credit for guessing. Yes, right. Yeah, Jose Morelos. Who is Jose Morelos? Um, was in the Revolutionary War, not Revolutionary Independence. Yeah, Revolutionary and Independence fighter. Uh, and so, in my talk today, I'm going to talk about how Jose Morelos, considered to be one of the founders, uh, really, and one of the leading uh, generals of the Mexican War of Independence roughly 1810 to 1821, for those of you doing chronology, interacts with James Madison and is really critical for us in understanding a way to re-envision American history along the lines of which I think we need to be going. Um, the book that, I'm, that I've finished now will be out in the late summer, early fall, is titled An African American and Latinx History of the United States. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to emphasize the centrality of African American and Latinx narratives, or uh, Latino uh, narratives, and not just saying that these narratives bring something to the table and helping us understand American history. Each of the authors in this series have been asked to essentially re-envision American history from the ground up. And so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the kind of the early 19th century piece of this. Uh, and as Troy mentions, I, uh, as he suggested, I'm not mastered time travel, so I've never been able to interview Jose Morales or James Madison. Uh, but I've had a chance to take a look at some of their papers, um, and, it's, and it's, it's fascinating. The centrality of the Mexican War of Independence in American history is quite startling. And all I've done, basically, for those of you doing research here, is I've just scratched the surface. Um, and I've, I've suggested, I'm going to show you an outline, a chapter outline of the book in a few minutes, but there's so much more research to, to really to do on this. Um, so anyway, in the two presentations, today and then tomorrow, I want to present American history as part of this tapestry um, of struggle in both the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, don't ever let anyone tell you that Americans don't care about history. That's a myth. I don't know where that started from. Um, we have just finished a presidential campaign, a very bitterly contested campaign, 
in which the Republican nominee, Donald Trump, used, he essentially branded his entire campaign with a historical frame. Make America great again. That's a historical uh, plea, if you will. It's, it's calling people to go back to a, an earlier time period. That's a historical framework. Last night, I was picked up at the Madison Airport by a cab driver. And we were talking, you know, you know how you get into a cab or a bus and you're trying to make small talk, right? And um, he found out I was giving some talks about history. And uh, he said, hey, can you help me with, with, a, with a question? He said, I've been arguing with a bunch of friends in Madison, and they're telling me that the Civil War, or how did he put it? He said, they're telling me that slavery didn't have anything to do with the Civil War. Uh, can you help me with that? You know, do you think that's true? I said, well, of course it isn't true. The Civil War was all about slavery. And here's some, you know, I can give you, I can, by now, I should be able to do this, thankfully. Um, I can give him some documents to tell him how and what integral part uh, and role that slavery played in the coming of the Civil War. I could tell him that the secession convention in Tallahassee in Florida, that slavery was really the only issue discussed. Not states' rights, not individual freedom, but property and slaves. And he was, and he was, he, we had such a great discussion, uh, Troy, that he, he actually, we pulled off to the side of the road. He said, do you mind if I pull the meter off for a while? Because I, I want to take some notes. Um, but all this by way of saying that history really matters to people. And he said, I'm going to go back to my friends and talk to them about the Civil War and slavery. And I suggested some films for him, uh, Cold Mountain, uh, Free, Free State of Jones, or Free County of Jones, I think, the Matthew McConaughey film. Uh, and it was a really engaging discussion. Over the next few days, I want us to grapple with the concept of American exceptionalism. And I want to argue that in order for us to move forward in our historical understanding of the place we live in, of the increasing integration of the Americas, we've got to, to, to finally do away with the concept. I'll explain what I mean by American exceptionalism as we kind of go forward. But as by way of preface, it begins with this idea of the American Revolution as kind of this unambiguous forward democratic movement. As Gerald Horn and others have argued recently, that is problematic. It ignores the role that the American Revolution plays in essentially empowering genocide against Native Americans. It ignores the fact that the American Revolution, if, if we take the words of the founders themselves, uh, if we go back and read their letters, their correspondence, they're terrified, above all, that the mother country is going to abolish slavery. There's a very famous ruling that has just passed in London, which puts the entire regime, the entire system of slavery into question, it's, and essentially says, or at least people think it says, that no longer, if you own a slave in the empire, no longer can you bring them to the mother country. No longer can you bring them to Brixton or to London. Uh, you have to emancipate them if that happens. This terrifies Jefferson. This terrifies Washington. And so the, you can see kind of uh, uh, expedited movement towards independence because of this ruling. It's actually called the Somerset Ruling for those of you who are taking, taking notes. And Gerald Horn has written a wonderful book on that. But the other thing is that um, I also want us to think about not just history in the past, but how history today is really one of the main battlefields we have to fight on if we're interested in equity and justice. I mentioned the concept of the cab driver, uh, but we have a lot of movements that, that accomplish certain things in this country. We had the Voting Rights uh, Act in 1965. Um, that's gone. Uh, we had the Chicano movement in the 1970s. There's been a backlash against that. And so history is in a very important battleground. And again, I come from this military background, so I apologize for using military metaphors quite a bit, but I also come from a labor organizing background. Uh, so that's where I really learned my movement history, was as a United Farm Worker organizer in the late 80s and early 90s, working on the Chateau Saint-Michel uh, wine boycott, and then later the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. But what I learned there is that, you know, we organize picket lines, we go out on strikes, we do those kind of conventional labor things,
But unless you capture the historical high ground, um, you're going to lose the battle. And, and until you can explain that your people, your family, is entitled to dignity, until I can get you to understand that my parents, my mother, my father, my grandparents, my ancestors, uh, are entitled to as much dignity and as much respect as your ancestors are, uh, we cannot have a discussion. We, in other words, we can't have an equal discussion until we treat each other with a certain sense of dignity and equality. You just can't, you really can't do it. This is not a discussion, right? This is a lecture. Y'all are listening, some of you were assigned to come here, but if we're going to have a real discussion, we have to be able to respect each other. And, and history plays a very important role uh, in that. So let me talk a little bit about the, the forthcoming book. Um, this was the world that my father grew up in. And the very idea that we can do African American and Latino history and do it in a comparative ethnic studies frame, which is the framework that I use in the book. And by the way, I'm not the first person. This is I, I make no claim for originality because people have been doing this work for, for generations, as, as, as Ben and other folks in this room very well know. Uh, people like Vicki Ruiz, people like John O. Franklin, um, people like Ernesto Garza, uh, and, and, and getting us beyond the notion of a biracial black and white framework. That is, race relations, if we believe in such a thing called race relations, our racism has never been simply a matter of black and white. Um, in my background, my parents and my, my ancestors came to the United States in 1914. My grandfather, I mentioned, fought in the Mexican Revolution. This was the world that my father grew up in. He worked in a restaurant in Houston, Texas. He was, he never saw, this is interesting, he never saw the front of the sign. Why would he never have seen the front of the sign if he worked in the restaurant? Can anyone guess? Yeah, he was not allowed to go in the front door. He worked in the back, away from the clientele to not offend them. Uh, his, pres his very presence was offensive, and so he worked in the kitchen. Uh, the people that were customers never saw him. But the reason I want to flash in on this, I'm not going to read my slide, and I'm not, I'm not going to read these verbatim, but this image does a lot for me. It's very personal on the one hand. I grew up with, with kind of a Jim Crow, Juan Crow in California in the, in, in the 70s, but not like this. We didn't ha I didn't have to deal with signs like this. Um, but what I want you to flash in on is, is this character, Frederick Douglass. In my book, he's a very important person because Douglass moves international. He moves across borders. This is a central argument I make in this book. To understand United States history, I had to leave the country. I had to go out. You know, first I mentioned I was a soldier, but then in terms of being a scholar, I couldn't understand the United States simply by studying sources inside the country. And today, I have no idea how I did that in an earlier iteration of my development as an American historian. And if I could do time travel, I'd go back to graduate school and change my curriculum, right? I would say, we have to go to Africa, we have to go to Latin America, we have to go to Asia to truly really understand the United States. Now, obviously, I can't take my readers to all these places, so I'm just kind of focusing on the Americas. But Frederick Douglass was an international traveler. He was an international freedom fighter. And so he goes to Ireland, he goes to Belfast in 1846, and he talks about the Mexican War of Independence. And what I've discovered, in, and I'll show you the chapter outline in a minute, but the Mexican War of Independence is a major event in United States history. It shows up over and over and over again. And this is just one of many um, quotes or passages in my book in which a key person like Douglas and at one point Henry Highland Garnett uh, at another point are talking about this war. And they're talking about why it is the United States invades Mexico in 1846, but they point back to the War of Independence. Why did they do this? Because the Mexican War of Independence on its surface was fought to abolish slavery. And when I've studied Morelos more in depth, I've looked at his organizing strategies. Um, there were forward steps and backward steps, but essentially slavery is pretty well abolished in Mexico by the time that it's simply expanding like, like gangbusters in the United States. So we have one state which is suppressing and abolishing and doing away with slavery, and another state to the north 
in which slavery is getting stronger and stronger year by year by year. And Douglas tells us this is the clash, this is the conflict, this is why the United States is invading Mexico. It is not because of manifest destiny, whatever that means. That's an abstraction, by the way. Um, it's because of, of plain economics, the economics of slavery. Slavery grows or it dies. It exhausts the land, it exhausts bodies. You can't have a plantation and have it be static in the same place year after year after year. That's why slavery in the U.S. starts in a great arc, right, from Northern Virginia all the way down to East Texas. And it's not, it's not expanding just for chronological purposes. It's expanding because it's exhausting the land. There are some parts of the South where you still can't even plant food crops because they're still depleted by generations of plantation slavery. So, so slavery is growing. Douglas says that the U.S. wants to push slavery back into Mexico, but another thing's happening here too: um, imperialism and racialization. What I mean, what do I mean by this? So Martha Menchaca has had, has a wonderful book in which he's talking about kind of the racialization of Mexican Americans, and some people talk about Mexican Americans as being a, a you know is, is it a race is you know is being Mexican a race or is being a Latino a race or is it an ethnicity? She argues that we need to take a racialization approach. That is, people from Mexico in particular, but other parts of Latin America as well, are racialized. That is, they're turned into kind of the racialized other, not because of biological reasons, because as we know, race is a fiction, right? But for very for political and social and economic reasons, which I'll get into uh, in a minute. But I want you to flash in on that the connection between imperialism and racialization, Douglas going to Ireland, talking about the U.S. invasion of Mexico in 1846. So, in the book I talk about people who contested empire from the very outset. Francisco Ramirez, who was a great journalist in California, both during the, the Mexican period, uh, but even after the U.S. invades and conquers California. And Ramirez is one of that generation of, of, of uh, Mexican leaders and, and journalists in California who is anti-slavery. He is arguing against the expansion of slavery and he talks about the denigrating impacts that slavery is going to have on Mexican descent people uh, in California. And the interesting thing is he's being rediscovered. Uh, this is a mural done by uh, children uh, in Pasadena. It's very interesting how a lot of these characters now, which we'd forgotten about, are being kind of reclaimed and, and, and rediscovered. <coughs> so obviously we're in, we're in Wisconsin, uh, William Appleman Williams, um, a great scholar, one of the first scholars who could talk about imperialism without blinking, um, uh, very clearly talking about, in this case, the tragedy of American diplomacy, but in a later essay essentially talking about how empire is one of the major themes of American history. Uh, in an earlier period, again, under American exceptionalism, the idea was that the U.S. had avoided the entanglements of empire. And when I was in high school, that's what we were taught. But even when I was in high school, it was outdated. We hadn't read William Appleton Williams, who taught us that empire was always an integral aspect um, of American history. But in my book, I'm talking about not just that fact, but also how anti-imperialism, I would argue, uh, you know, kind of pro-democracy anti-imperialism is just as an important uh, of a theme as imperialism in itself. Let me read a, a passage for you. So William Appleton Williams established the fact that empire as a way of life has been a central theme in U.S. history. Yes. It is also true, or yet is also true, that African Americans, Latinos, and their political allies at specific moments of history have espoused ideas that have allowed them to practice anti-imperialism as a way of life. In the first half of the 19th century, this was accomplished in part through the ideology of emancipatory internationalism, which developed as a mode of analysis often coupled with critiques against racial capitalism. Now we get the concept of racial capitalism from Cedric Robinson in his great work uh, on black Marxism. Uh, racial, some people say that's, that's um, you know, why do you just say capitalism? We want people to understand 
the racialized aspects of the capitalist system, obviously slavery, Jim Crow as labor systems. So given the domination of what Thomas Paine called the guilty masters in the American Revolution, and this, everyone knows who Thomas Paine was, right? He was a great pamphleteer of the American Revolution. He was the person that George Washington, when, when Washington was asked years later, who do you credit the most with really pushing the U.S. from independence to revolution? And Washington, without hesitation, said it was Thomas Paine. But Paine referred to that group of founders as, as the guilty masters. He said they couldn't do what really needed to be done at the end of the revolution, which was to abolish slavery, right? So what, what Thomas Paine called the guilty masters in the American Revolution and its aftermath. So in talking about what slavery was, the National Anti-Slavery Standard offered a riveting account of how the system worked during the Mississippi land boom of the 1830s. As cotton prices began to rise, quote, immediately a clamor was raised in Georgia and Mississippi for Indian lands. Georgia has a surplus slave population which he must send out of the state to find employment for by opening new lands. Again, the growth of slavery. As long as Native Americans lived in their ancestral homelands, however, there was no money to be made. In the end, this is quoting National Anti-Slavery Standard, as well as to reap the benefit of the high price of cotton, she must oust the Cherokee, she must oust the Mississippi, influenced more especially by the cotton fever and a desire to increase the population of the state by the immigration of planters, i.e. slave owners, and others must oust the Choctaws. And so you have here an abolitionist newspaper that's talking about the, the uh, essentially the, the, the imperial movement against Native Americans in order to expand slavery. Dr. Jamie Coon Smith, who is a black abolitionist, has told his audience at the Colored National Convention nearly two decades later, quote, there is no foot of American territory over which slavery is not already triumphant and will continue triumphant so long as there remains any foot of American territory on which it is admitted that man can hold property in man. So again, the connection between slavery and imperialism is absolutely vital here. So this critique of slavery and racial capitalism was a rejection of the idea, later referred to as, quote, American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States was uniquely democratic and served as an exemplar to other nations. In fact, just the opposite was true. The Frederick Douglass paper opined, quote, in spite of that resistance of public sentiment from the Seminole robbery, and we'll be talking about the Seminole Wars in just a few minutes, and massacres, the conquest and purchase of Texas, the Mexican robbery, this is how black abolitionists refer to the U.S. invasion of Mexico as the, Mexico, as the Mexican robbery, the robbery of that, of that land, to the compromise and the fugitive slave law these parties have dragged the country down until the, uh, until the opposing force in the parties is all spent and nothing but an external resistance can now prevent them from descending still to the lowest depths of dishonor, injustice, and oppression. So the question is, how did African Americans define freedom and emancipation in the early 19th century? And how did they challenge this growth, of this kind of imperial growth of slavery to the West, to the South? Remember the U.S. is sending filibusters to Latin America. Um, it's attacking Mexico. It's sending filibusters to Cuba. Uh, there's already major U.S. holdings in plantation slavery in Cuba by the 1810s, and, and, and actually even earlier. So I look at moments in the book in which I try to find uh, expressions of how people define freedom. And one of the central parts of the way that African Americans define freedom in the early 19th century is that they point to the intersection of freedom struggles in the United States, in Latin America, and in Haiti in particular. And so this concept of freedom is not confined to one nation. It's not confined to one state. Uh, it's not even always confined to one hemisphere. 
That is, black people are thinking very broadly. And so here, you, again, I will not read this, but you have many commemorations of Haitian independence, the Haitian Revolution, the first successful slave revolution in American history. The, the, the evidence is fragmentary, but wherever we can find evidence, we, we discover that black communities, particularly in port cities like Savannah, like Baltimore, like New York, look to Haiti as an exemplar, as an example of, of freedom. Um, and that's very important, again, for understanding and re-envisioning re what we think of as U.S. history. It's not just stuff happening in the United States proper, um, it's the ways in which people in this country have always made connections to other countries. This is a chapter outline uh, what I have, and according to my editor, so far it works. Um, the chapters are done. So far I've really been talking about the first two chapters. Um, but you can see the, the, with, with the themes here, the point is to put the U.S. in connection and link what's happening in the U.S. with what's happening around it, how those, those, those processes interact, um, how the external processes impact the United States, uh, vice versa. How conceptions of freedom are always international if we look hard enough. Um, the Civil War, Reconstruction, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, even in, in tomorrow, we'll go into more chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, but today we'll talk mainly about the first uh, four chapters. But I'm trying to, again to re-envision key events. The, the book is essentially a series of case studies. It's not comprehensive, we can't, you know, can't cover every single year, but I look carefully at the Civil War, uh, what, I, what I again, what I was trained to see of is the American or the U.S. Civil War, but again, if it turns out when you look at it more carefully, it's an international conflict. Uh, I learned that, by the way, that that's not an original insight on my part. That's what I learned from W. E. B. Du Bois. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction frames the Civil War and Reconstruction as an international conflict. He sees the prospect of successful Reconstruction as enhancing the possibility of freedom throughout the entire world, he sees the defeat of black reconstruction, the disenfranchisement of black people, as a disaster for people of color all over the world. So back to the Mexican War of Independence in U.S. history. Juxtapose these characters uh, at the very outset. How do they intersect? So the Mexican War of Independence starts in 1810. When I do this seminar with students on Thursday, um, I've asked them to read um, a pedagogical piece that I wrote for a journal called CalFu, which is a journal of comparative and relational ethnic studies. We'll just pass this around. Um, it's a really good journal if you're thinking of publishing and comparative ethnic studies. I really encourage you to, to think about publishing and CalFu. George Lipsitz uh, is a senior editor, Trisha Rose, and a lot of people working. I'm the book review editor, so if you have an idea, for a review or for a book you like to review, uh, please let me know. Um, but what we have here is a case in which, from the very outset, and this is debate within American diplomatic history, uh, from the very outset, when people in Mexico moved against the Spanish and began to fight their war of independence, from the very outset they tried to encourage the United States to join in, to participate. And the letter here, which I will not read, um, is essentially, though, a letter from Jose Morelos to James Madison. Uh, Morelos mo wrote more than one, and he was not the only person in Mexico to write to people like Madison. There were actually meetings, diplomatic meetings, that took place um, in an attempt to, to say, hey, you know, y'all just fought a war against a colonizer, you talked about slavery, you, know, you talked about oppression, you talked about unjust taxation. Um, we're fighting a war here too against a colonizer, which is every bit as bad as the, the one you all had to face. Uh, what about supporting us? What about joining in? Did the U.S. join in and support Mexico? That, that's, a, that's a plot spoiler, right? So I can't <laughs> answer that question for you when you won't read the book. Um, 
But what's important again is the attempt. And remember how we started with Frederick Douglass, referring back to the Mexican War of Independence. But now we, we kind of went backwards, we've done time travel, and you have one of the great leaders of that war, Jose Morelos, a person who became a great revolutionary general who espoused ideas to end slavery, to end caste oppression of indigenous people, uh, which was really just as important. If, if there is any, you know, the, the two central goals and the, and the way in which he used those two goals to recruit troops, right, to his, his revolutionary columns. Fighting the Spanish in 1810 was not a good idea. Very powerful armies, despite what people say now. Um, Simon Bolivar found out to his great chagrin, the Spanish were pretty good at fielding armies. Uh, they, they had pretty effective, uh, pretty effective weaponry. They had generations and even centuries of knowing how to put down uh, anti-colonial insurgencies. So if you took up arms against the Spanish, it was a serious proposition in 1810. Um, and you had to recruit who? To your, to your columns. You had to recruit, recruit indigenous people. You had to recruit African descent people. And so that's how he, he organized. We just commemorated a very important event in American history, actually the bicentennial. Um, and this is a piece that Fusion, which is a project at Univision, um, several of us were interviewed extensively for this, the Battle of Negro Fort was, is considered by historians to be one of the opening shots in the first Seminole World War. Now, has anyone here ever heard of the Seminole Wars? And yeah, no one. Um, the Seminole Wars, kind of imagine, I, I grew up, I had relatives that fought in the American War in Vietnam. The Seminole Wars were like the American War in Vietnam, but in the early 19th century. And as if the War in Vietnam happened, like, here or if you sent troops in Wisconsin to fight in Florida, because that's where the Seminole Wars were fought. The Seminoles were a confederation of indigenous people, of Native Americans, who had been pushed south from the Carolinas into Florida and reconfigured themselves as new, as new kind of hybrid Indian nation or nations and began to welcome and accept escaped slaves into their communities and they began to form a resistance to slavery in the American Southeast. So if you think about an American politician like John Quincy Adams, I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes, who's Secretary of State, and you're thinking about how to expand slavery in the 1810s, you have some problems here. Because number one, Mexico is fighting a war against slavery. Number two, you have a mounting resistance to your southeastern perimeter. Of, of Indians and, Af and people of African descent who are joining the Seminoles. In fact, Larry Rivers, um, a colleague of mine, argues that the Second Seminole War constitutes essentially the largest slave rebellion in American history. Uh, over a thousand enslaved people essentially rose up in an insurrection against their masters in northern Florida and southern Georgia, and that's kind of the opening shot of the Second Seminole War. But this is the first Seminole War. Um, and this involves all the, you, you guys have heard of these characters, Andrew Jackson, uh, John Quincy Adams, James Madison, um, Thomas you know, Jefferson is kind of involved at, at a great distance in a certain sense. But what happened was Negro Fort was a fort which the British had provisioned during the War of 1812, which was now peopled and defended by people of African descent, runaway slaves, uh, and Native Americans. And maybe a few poor white folks are in there as well. We're not sure. Um, but this is seen as a terrible threat to the United States. Not just to slavery, but the entire country of the United States, which is based on slavery. So I'm going to read, the second excerpt I'm going to read is from um, the chapter where I discuss the Seminole Wars. Now when I talk about John Quincy Adams, this is part of the revisioning of American history, which I'm, I'm, which I'm trying to kind of grapple with, because what do we know about John Quincy Adams and slavery? We know him as the person who was key, played a key role in defending the Amistad defendants, right? We've seen the film, Amistad, right? Uh, we know him as a person who gave a very eloquent speech against slavery in the late 1830s. But that's, that's when he's a congressman and in many ways his powers was greatly diminished. 
We're talking about him here, I'm talking about him here when he's Secretary of State. So this is what he does when he's Secretary of State from 1816 to 1819. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams gave the pretext for launching the First Seminole War by claiming that during the War of 1812, British commanders in Florida, which then was, was controlled by the Spanish, quote, in their invitations and promises to the slaves to run away from their masters and join them, did not confine themselves to the slaves of the United States. They received with this hearty welcome and employed with equal readiness the fugitives from their masters in Florida as those from Georgia. John Quincy Adams frequently clashed with Andrew Jackson in political conflicts with the early republic. However, Adams agreed with the general on the need to secure the nation's southern borders against the threat of revolt in the Americas, not just in Florida. The premier American diplomat of his time revealed his own attitude towards the Mexican War of Independence and his viewpoint on the insurgents in Latin America in a series of letters to family as well as, to, as in his diplomatic correspondence with Spain during the negotiations which led to the adams onus Treaty of 1819. In a letter written in 1818, Adams contrasted the American Revolution, which he characterized as, quote, a war of freedom with the Latin American independence wars. He said, quote, the struggle in South America is savage and ferocious, almost beyond example. It is not a tug of war between Greek and Greek, but the tiger conflict between Spaniard and Spaniard. The cause has never been the same in any two of the revolting colonies. Independence has not even been the pretext during the great part of the time. Sometimes they had fought for king, uh, sometimes for parliament, sometimes for congresses and constitutions, and sometimes for particular leaders like Morelos, Hidalgo, Artigas, or Bolivar. The resemblance between this revolution and ours is barely superficial. In all their leading characters, the two events present a contrast instead of a parallel. Ours was a war for free men, free men, for political independence. Theirs is a war of slaves against their masters. It has all the horrors and all the atrocities of a servile war. And this is something that John Quincy Adams and others said over and over again. Don't mistake the anti-colonial wars in Latin America or in Mexico or the Caribbean with our war of independence. Our war is a war of free men. And I could cite chapter and verse. This goes on page after page after page. But in a sense, they're not only... Dis John Quincy Adams is not only distinguishing the American Revolution from the wars of independence in Latin America. He's racializing people. And I go more in depth in the book about how he essentially says... People in Latin America can't really experience freedom and can't think of freedom the way that you and I do. And this is an early part of what I refer to not only as the racialization um, of kind of othering people in Latin America, but also creating a sense of whiteness. Like white people can understand what freedom is. White people can legitimately revolt against power. But people in Latin America, these mixed people, these African descent people, can't do that. Um, and and th this is part of, part of the argument. So now we're time traveling again and kind of uh, moving towards the uh, conclusion here. Um, we come across Frederick Douglass. And when I first ran into this quote, it really blew my mind. This is one of, one of the first passages I grappled with for months and months because Douglass was asked to give a speech before a group of essentially people who had been abolitionists, they had been anti-slavery activists, um, at the National Hall in Philadelphia, which was a very <coughs> prominent meeting place for abolitionists and others. And the people that invited Douglas to come and speak to talk about the causes of the Civil War thought that Douglas was going to come and give them a speech which would make them feel good, which would make the which would essentially say, you know, the South is terrible for seceding. Uh, they're upholding slavery, you all are fighting for freedom, you know, keep going. If you know anything whatsoever about Frederick Douglass, you know that he was not going to give that speech. He's too honest of a man. And when he went to make the speech, he does, does quite the contrary, because he says, when I study your history, when I study the history of how you fought the Seminoles, purchased Louisiana, 
Annex, Texas, fought Mexico, did all these things. This is why you have the Civil War. Don't blame it on the South. Look at your own actions. Look at yourself in the mirror. Um, Frederick Douglass, by the way, would often preface his lectures by saying, I don't know why you even invited me here to speak. It's, you've insulted me by, by this, this is how he begins the, the 4th of July speech, right? What to the Negro is the 4th of July? Uh, he was a tremendous speaker. And here he's not giving people any easy outs. But he, again, he's re-envisioning and re-imagining American history. It's not just what happens in the U.S., it's how the U.S. relates to the rest of the world, it's how it's pushing its, import, its imperial boundaries, and now it's kind of the chickens coming home to roost moment. That's what the Civil War is to Frederick Douglass. It's not a, simply a battle of North versus South. It's not simply a question of slavery versus freedom. It's a question of international relations. And as we move into Reconstruction, Reconstruction as an international event, and again, this is something I learned from W.E.B. Du Bois, but what I needed to do was to go and do my own research to realize just how many dimensions of internationalism were in both the American Civil War but also in Reconstruction. So here's another trick question I asked my students at the beginning of the semester. What year did slavery end in the United States? Now no one's going to ask, answer, right? As I said, it's a trick question. 1965. No, so it never ended, because it's, it's in the Constitution. It, it's yeah. Like prisoners. Okay, so, so different answers. See, in, in the old school, We'd say 1865. That's what I learned. Slavery ends in 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, right? In 1865, when slavery supposedly ended, the American anti-slavery movement had an intense discussion. And the discussion was not really a discussion. It was a tremendous debate and a, and a really vituperous debate. And it went along these lines. A certain wing of the American anti-slavery movement said, we need to celebrate the fact that this bloody war has ended, the 13th Amendment is passing, the other Reconstruction Amendments are happening. Um, it's time to disband the American anti-slavery society. We fought a good fight. Uh, this is the culmination of our dreams. Um, now it's time to kind of pick up and go home and kind of, you know, kind of pull the fences in. Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, most black abolitionists said, what are you guys talking about? Number one, slavery hasn't really ended here. Plantation owners haven't been out slavery. But number two, what about Cuba? What about Brazil? What about Africa? If we compromise and say we're going to disband the anti-slavery movement simply because the Civil War has ended, and the 13th Amendment has passed, what kind of people does that make us? It makes us cowards. And what happens is, is that African Americans create a number of different organizations. In the book I talk about this kind of generational uh, leadership that occurs, but here I'll just mention the, um, this organization, the Cuban Anti-Slavery Committee, which started a national petition campaign when the Cuban insurrection, when the Cuban War, um, Cuban War Liberation, Ten Years War, uh, some scholars call it, breaks out in Cuba, a lot of African Americans organize in places like, again, New York, Baltimore, Savannah, and create committees of correspondence and say, what can we do to support the anti-slavery liberation struggle in Cuba? So they form the Cuban Anti-Slavery Committee, they organize nationally. And when I say nationally, I mean that they organize chapters in, in every community where there's a substantial amount of African Americans. What do I mean by this? Um, Santa Cruz, California, in 1873, has a Cuban anti-slavery committee. Who knew there were that many African Americans in Santa Cruz, California, in 1873? Uh, Silver City, uh, Nevada, all of these towns where African Americans live have Cuban anti-slavery committees, and they organize a national movement to collect, uh, to, to sign and collect petitions demanding that the United States government support the anti-slavery movement in Cuba. And at one point it suggested that they collected upwards of 500,000 
signatures in this national petition campaign. I haven't been able to verify that. That really makes that a national movement. And just kind of wrap up here, um, there's a number of speeches you can go to in, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Josiah T. Walls is especially meaningful for us in Florida and actually in Gainesville. He's an African-American political leader in, in Gainesville, Florida. Um, forgotten to history is the fact that he was a lead advocate of the Cuban anti-slavery movement. These were activists like Walls in close contact with people in Cuba because as if, you, if you're familiar with Latin American history, you know that really by the 1860s, there are Cuban emigres and Cuban refugees and Cuban freedom fighters working in places like Tampa, Key West, New York, Baltimore, and organizing kind of international solidarity um, efforts. Some of the leaders um, of the Cuban Anti-Slavery Society were familiar with these in a different context. Um, if we just look at them as black abolitionists, they're just black abolitionists. But when we follow their careers, we discover that they're part of international solidarity movements to, again, expand the conception of freedom beyond just the United States, to think of freedom as something that's America's, America's want. Du Bois, again, uh, is really the capstone of the, of, of the center part of the book, both as an activist, as a scholar, as a person who, in, in the Great Depression, because the Great Depression, again, was not just a national event, it was an international event. And Du Bois is, getting us, is trying to get us to understand Reconstruction not just as a national event, but as an international event. What he says is that the disenfranchisement of African Americans is a tremendous tragedy for people of the global south because the most effective and active anti-imperial wing of the American electorate is disenfranchised. And what we've done now in, 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 in kind of sussing out the roots of the American, of the uh, Cuban, uh, Cuban anti-slavery movement is to show this is what was lost. You went from a, a, a moment of possibility where tens of thousands of Americans are concerned, deeply concerned, and, and fighting and signing petitions on behalf of the freedom of people in another country to disenfranchisement, to where they have no political power. And then we have to ask the question, why did disenfranchisement happen? Why, why was it aimed at black people, and why did it last so long? Um, in the book, I talk about disenfranchisement against um, Mexican Americans in, in the Southwest as well. Um, but I'll kind of wrap it up by getting us to think about um, kind of tomorrow. We're ending today really kind of in the late 19th century. So African Americans, Native Americans, and Mexicans and other groups waged protracted struggles against slavery in the first half of the 19th century. Increasingly, critics of slavery pointed out that the system depended upon constant growth and movement, hence the occupation of new lands to survive. The determination to fight the slave power and to create a culture of anti-imperialism is a singular achievement and requires a complete revisioning of antebellum U.S. history. African Americans repeatedly pointed out that slavery and imperialism were fatally intertwined and encoded in the nation's institutions from the very beginning with grave consequences for all of the citizens of the Americas, not only black people. Hence, the Christian Recorder which was the national newspaper of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, interpreted U.S. history not through the flattering lens of American exceptionalism, but in a way that explained the struggles to come. Quote, George Washington signed a fugitive slave bill, and Jefferson annexed Louisiana in its interest. It caused the War of 1812, the war with Mexico, and the present war, talking about the Civil War. It is met today in its own merits. Our statesmen do not yet avow it, but they feel it. We may have to fight for political existence, for personal liberty, even. Thank you for your patience. I think we can turn the lights. Glad you're still out there. I can't see you. <laughs> Well, I often 
I thought it was intriguing uh, how you talked about uh, black thinkers of, uh, uh, looking at slavery and, uh, and uh, imperialism as intertwined. Uh, but I wonder, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the way these black thinkers uh, in the early 18th century uh, reflected on racial hierarchies in Latin America, which are much more complex right. uh, than, than they were in the United States. But what was their thinking about that? Uh, I mean, clearly at the very top, uh, you had a, a white ruling class uh, as you did in the United States. But then it was much more complicated, and also with black people at the bottom of that social hierarchy. Right. Well, what was their thinking uh, about this, this uh, complication and this variation? I mean, it's very interesting. It, it's as complicated, I think, black people's thinking about racial hierarchies in, in New Spain or Latin America is probably just as complicated as those hierarchies were in those, in those areas. Because on the one hand, some African American thinkers and newspapers would, would, would kind of focus in on the wars themselves. And they would say, who's fighting these wars? Who, are, who kind of make up the foot soldiers of these wars. Um, Haiti plays a central role in that because it, from an early period of time, people in the United States, at least in these port cities like Baltimore, understand that Haiti contributes a tremendous kind of forward momentum to some of these wars of independence in the sense that, you know, Simon Bolivar goes there, um, the struggle in Central America is, is aided quite a bit uh, by the Haitians, so there's a knowledge of that, of that happening. On the other hand, there is a romanticization of race relations in Latin America. And you will see black thinkers sometimes say that, well, um, unlike the United States, you know, race relations are much better in Mexico, or much better in Latin America or in the Caribbean. And in a later period of time, which I'll talk about tomorrow, that period of time, the Spanish-American War, um, there's, there's a debate within black communities about, well, should we go fight? If we go fight and support the United States, then the U.S. is going to um, exacerbate and, and, and ruin race relations in Cuba, just like they've done in the United States. Um, and there is, is that. So on the one hand, there's a uh, romanticization, uh, but on the other hand, there's a very kind of complex understanding of well, for lack of a better term, hybridity. I mean, here's, here's another example of um, what I mean by complexity. So when African Americans look at a person like Antonio Maceo, um, one of the, the lead generals uh, in the Cuban War of Liberation in the 1890s, they don't just see a black man. They don't just see an indigenous person. They don't just see a European. They see a person of different racial and ethnic ancestries. And they talk about that as being a strength. And they talk about that, you know, wouldn't it be great in the United States if we could see that kind of admixture as a strength? I mean, some black public, and this is interesting, some scholars have said, well, African Americans in the U.S. admired Maceo because they saw him as a black man. And I found that to not be the case. I found that they admired him because he was a man of tremendous principles and, and heroism and courage. And there's a masculine aspect to the admiration as well. I mean, he's, wounded you know, numerous times, he loses many of his relatives to the Spanish, obviously. But again, their conception of him in cities like Chicago, so for example, when he dies, um, Ida B. Wells, who we know in different, con you know, Ida B. Wells is kind of working um, in parallel lines of people like Jose Martí. They cover the same lynchings in some cases, and, and I talk about this in the book. Um, but when Maceo dies, Ida B. Wells is part of this effort to kind of memorialize him. And again, the way he's memorialized in Chicago and other black communities is of a person who is of a very complex racial background. He's not just black, he's not just white. You know, he's part of a broader mixture of people. So I think that's an elliptical response to your question, but, but it's a very complex kind of response. Um, there's clearly a sense, and, and when you move forward in time, in 1912, when you have the you know the massacre of, of, of independent politics in Cuba, there's a reaction among African Americans that says that that massacre was essentially uh, uh, not planned in the U.S., but essentially overdetermined by the U.S. being involved in Cuba. There's no saying, well, hey, well, you know, there's a casta system in the Spanish Empire, 
there was racism before the U.S. came to to Cuba, right? So, so yeah, there's a little bit of, of both. Um, when I was a graduate student, though, I have to say this: um, we were still reading some texts which really romanticize race relations in Latin America, which were written by PhDs. So I, I couldn't fault people in the early 19th century with not quite getting everything correct, right? <coughs> Yeah, you brought up um, Adams and then like uh, the, the international context of abolitionist movement after Haiti. Um, and there's a, in one of uh, Douglas Edgerton's books, he talks about um, the ramifications of the election of 1796, I believe, when yeah. Adams versus Jefferson. And Adams actually runs on a platform where he's talking about normalizing diplomatic relations with the Haitian government and, and having them become an actual trade partner. Right. And, then, and then, I mean, which is, I, I mean, he's an abolitionist, but he was, uh, you know, he was anti-slavery, but that seems like incredibly radical for the period. Um, and then obviously, like, Jefferson wins, not so ironically, using the three-fifths uh, three clause to get the votes to, uh, to become president. Yeah. But, like, I mean, that seems like, it, can you speak more on that? Like, yeah. Well, how, and, close, how close and, were we? Yeah, and people, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an important question, and Edgerton obviously... I mean, the whole milieu of the Tidewater, of Richmond, of places like that, he, seen, you know, he suggests that this is one of the things that really makes people believe that revolt is possible, right? Um, but in terms of, of looking at that as a counterfactual, I mean, Adams, and, and, I mean, and the response to that would also be, when did the U.S. finally normalize relations with Haiti? The American, you know, during the, the war, during the Civil War, I mean, it's, it's seven decades later. The Adams, the, the family, you know, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams plays a particular role in this book. I kind of follow them over time. I, this was not purposeful. This was kind of accidental. Because you're right. I mean, Adams and people like Hamilton, at one, if you follow, if you look at them at one moment seem to be taking kind of almost progressive stances, but then when you look at them a moment later, suddenly Alexander Hamilton is trading slaves, and suddenly John Adams kind of takes it back, you know, and when John Quincy Adams is writing to his father uh, about um, the Latin American Wars of Independence, they're commiserating with each other about how, we, how backwards the Latin Americans and the Africans are, and so, uh, all I can say is that you have to understand also that France, the great, you know, Great Britain and Spain are involved in that kind of intrigue, um, and that the U.S. default back to Jefferson is to essentially um, participate, to be implicated in, and to help France continue its stranglehold over Haiti. But that is a moment. That's an important moment of, of opportunity that certainly enslaved people see. They see this conflict between Jefferson and Adams. The Haitian Revolution, of course, people see the conflict between the supporters of the French Revolution and the people who did support the French Revolution. And then they kind of use that to, to rise up. That's what I'm kind of interested in here, is what kind of spaces do people at the kind of grassroots see? Um, as far as the diplomatic cables and things, it's not quite clear, uh, except for Again, the outcome is that um, you know, normalization does not happen for, for generations. But these are great questions. I love these. I'll try to be more concise in my next response if you ask me a smaller question. <laughs> Any surprises that folks have in terms of, of the, the history that's presented, or uh, things you didn't know, perhaps, or I guess on the surface, um, back to Haiti, I'm wondering if how our treatment of Haitians today has much to do with how influential they were with their revolts. Then. Yeah. It has a lot to do with that. I mean, again, you're, you're, you're doing historical thinking. You're taking history seriously. And it's a really important research question. 
I mean, I would argue that that the history of this, the current relations are very much intertwined, very much connected together. Um, I have a friend who served in Special Forces in the unit that I served in at a different time. His name is Stan Goff. He wrote a book called Hideous Dream. He deployed to Haiti uh, when the U.S. went, went with Jean Bertrand Aristide back to Haiti. Stan's argument, based on being the inside of that deployment, was that the U.S. designed that whole um, sequence to fail, that it did not want the, the Haitians to be able to construct a working government. And the reason he came to this conclusion was, I mean, he was a master sergeant in special forces. He was, you know, Stan was a life, he was a decorated veteran from the Vietnam War. And but what he noticed was when he first went into, into Haiti, his superior officers were ordering him to arrest community organizers, priests, teachers, community organizers, mm -hmm. and all the people who could have reconstructed the society. And he began asking his superiors, why are you having us arrest the key organizers of the people who could put the society back together again? And because he questioned that system, he was given the choice of either retiring or facing a court martial. They didn't want a court martial him because he was a decorated hero and he won a number of medals. But that his argument was that the U.S. needs Haiti to fail. And if you look at the long history of U.S.-Haitian relations, there are there. Are, but again, you have to pose that question as a historian. I'm just giving you that, that Stan Goff's response based on this history. I guess that was my biggest surprise to see how much like black and white shows were looking at Haiti as a I mean, black intellectuals in the 1920s, uh, James Walton Johnson, goes to the country. I mean, there's, a, again, a long line, and, and there's tensions there. I mean, Frederick Douglass becomes ambassador. You know, he's in Haiti. And um, well, when James Walton Johnson is there in the 1920s, he does an investigative look into the U.S. occupation of Haiti. And he says, this is an imperial occupation. This is brutal. Thousands of people have been killed. Women have been raped by U.S. soldiers. And we need to stop this. And he poses the same question that you're posing now. Why is the U.S. treating Haiti the way it's treating Haiti? But it, now it's James Walton Johnson, kind of a mainstream leader within the NAACP. But in, in, in the book, um, I talk about other kind of people we've seen as mainstream leaders. People like Mordecai Johnson, who was the president of Howard University for many years. Mordecai Johnson goes on the radio and says that the U.S. invades, you know, occupied Haiti in order to prop up New York banks. That chapter I have back here called The Government of American Banks. Mm -hmm. uh, you all probably know where I got that phrase from, right? That's W.E.B. Du Bois's phrase. He says that the U.S. Is, it goes into Honduras, it goes into Panama, it goes into DR, it goes into Haiti to to support the ability of U.S. banks to take over the debt of Caribbean and Latin American nations. Now, I know you just had a speaker that talked about the long 19th century, right? Read his thesis about how, this is another trick, trick question, the long 19th century doesn't just refer to the, to the 19th century. When, who's, who's the last speaker? Is Josh? Josh Corbin. Uh, yeah, and I know Josh. Josh would have said, he would, Josh would have talked about financialization. Did he not talk about financialization? Mm -hmm. So, finance, what is financialization? <laughs> right. It's, it, well, let's do Cliff's notes of it. It's, the, it. it's a point in which a national or international economy transitions from, from say, factory labor, I'm going to do a fast word here, to a, a system where finance capital is at the center of the system where other forms of exchange are, are kind of, um, are lessened and banks and banks become the capstone uh, political and economic actors of the society, right? So diplomatic historians are beginning to make the argument that the U.S. invasion of Haiti in the 1915 occupation, the U.S. invasion of Nicaragua, I mean, when I got to, this is weird, when I got to Central America in 1984, I thought that Augusto Sandino was still alive. 
because I mean I'm, I was I was you know a 20, 20 year old sergeant in special forces. I'm looking everywhere I went. There were images, murals of this man, Augusto Sandino, the Sandinistas. I thought he was I thought he was alive. He had such a power in the region, but he was the one who was fighting the U.S. occupation, not when I was there, but in the 1920s. And this new generation of diplomatic historians are arguing that the U.S. goes into Haiti, into Central America in the 1920s because of financialization, because they're going there to essentially allow American banks to take control of Latin American debt, to take control of the debt of Haiti. And, and again, this is, this is multifaceted. This is competition between French banks, British banks, American banks. But that's what we mean by financialization. And that, and that, that argues for continuity in the U.S. relationship to, to Haiti.